Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada King yeah. Iskans founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada King yeah. Grantaraj Sri Madhurya Kadambani King yeah. Sri Sri Radha Ratnap King yeah. Sri Sri Nitai Gora Hari King yeah. Sankirtan Yagya King yeah. Gopinandi all glories to their sonal devotees. All glories to their sonal devotees. All glories to their sonal devotees. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Goranga. All glories to Sri Prabhupada.
Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shavadi Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaur Dodani Pracharine Nero Vishesha Shunyavadi Vastu Chade Shatarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunitya Nanda Sri Advaita Gadadha Sri Vasadi Gaur Dr. Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare, 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 Rama, Hare, Rama, 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 Hare, Hare. Vaj kam tribus trakri prasindu vya elacha. Padidana bhavane vya vaishnave vya namo nama. Welcome devotees to our second session on Sri Madhurya Kadamani. And did I notice someone came in with a copy of the book? Or was I imagining? Was it you, Shankaranda? No, it wasn't you. Oh, okay. Okay, anyway, I did hear that some copies were going to manifest. But, anyway. Was it you who told me, Yamaraj Prabhu? He sent a PDF. Oh, on your device. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Well, you can have a look on your devices. Let me just tell you where we are in the actual text. We are almost in chapter 2, but not quite, just a sec. We're still in the introduction, actually, but we are getting there, making progress. So, right, you can see we discussed yesterday, Bhakti is independent, you remember that. Then different possibilities that people may think that bhakti arises in someone's heart or, or faith, shraddha, some interest even like that. They're, it's basically, they're, they're all the same idea. Um, and that, how was that? By the mercy of the madhyam adhikaris particularly. Right. So now the next section, I, I'm not sure which sort of version you have. Do you have a section coming up just now? Well, there's one, the mercy of the Lord and his devotee. Do, is the copy you have, does it include that as like a subheading? And then after that, what is it? Is bhakti caused by nishkam karma? Is that in your version? No. Uh, okay. Well, let us, just to get you really up to speed, um, have a look where we're sort of halfway through the first, the introduction, and there should be a paragraph which begins in proposing the unqualified mercy of the devotee. Do you see that? Yes. Oh, you do. Uh, can, ladies, can you see that? Yes. In proposing, right, the unqualified mercy of the devotee. Let me try and find that, everyone. It's sort of not quite halfway, maybe a third of the way through the first chapter. Are you there? I mean, have you got it? Okay. So, yeah, so we're going to carry on from, more or less from there, actually a little couple of paragraphs further down. Yes. Anyway, the point is made that the Lord 
uh, it, the natural relationship between the Lord and the devotee is that the Lord becomes subservient to the devotee. So therefore, if a devotee wants to give another person some Krishna conscious mercy or just some Krishna consciousness, Krishna will facilitate that. Yeah. So, but it's based on the devotee's desire, really, as we said, as we read about the Madhyam Adhikaris. Yes, okay. So we go down, let me just see uh, how many paragraphs. If one, no, uh, oh dear. Um, the Lord is indeed partial to his devotee, right? Then next paragraph, one, then two, here we see, then but one should not conclude. And then the next paragraph, do you see that? Through many scriptural statements, so it's like four paragraphs or so down from what we were looking at. Got it. The point there is that, or the question which arises is, you know, we, we've said that bhakti or faith in the Lord, interest in the Lord or devotion, I mean like a little devotion uh, towards the Lord, cannot be caused by something material. You remember that because bhakti, faith in the Lord, that's spiritual. Right. So, however, having said that, sometimes these, like, like piety, certain types of piety, particularly if they're really quite pronounced, but anyway, certain types of piety may act as doors for bhakti to enter into a person's heart. And in this way, people may think that it was just the piety which caused the bhakti, but it wasn't exactly. The, the, the piety acted as a door. And an example is, you know, if someone is vegetarian, and in fact, there's a, a very good example. Some of you would remember, I think, Mother Acha Vigraha. Some of you knew her, but you must have known her. Of her. Okay, anyway, she was a really nice devotee from Yeovil and uh, very pious. She, before she met devotees, she had been vegan on principle. On principle. She'd been living on brown rice practically. For I think it was 12 years already, a very austere. So, you know, it's a type of piety, anti-meat eating, you know, that sort of idea, that's piety. So one devotee invited her to the Sunday program at, in those days, Mulder's Drift. And the devotee said, oh, I'm, yeah, the devotee said, you know, the Hare Krishnas, they're vegetarian. And she said, oh, really? Oh, okay, I'll go then. So she came. It's a bit of a long story. Well, let me tell you the story because it's interesting. So she came, and everything was just really nice and interesting until the Sunday feast was served. And, you know, particularly in those days, maybe it's like that here too, but in those days in Mulder's Drift, Sunday feast meant everything is deep fried. <laughs> and those things which are not are just smothered in cream. And there's loads of spices and, you know, pretty powerful stuff. So she sat down to, with a plate of prasadam and she looked at it and she thought, 
you know, okay, these people are, are vegetarian, that's good, but this is crazy. <laughs> and so she didn't come back for a few months, but then somehow or other she came back and she became really nice devotee, extremely nice. So that piety acted as a door, but at the same time, in a certain sense, that piety acted as an obstacle when she saw this kind of overdone prasada. At least, you know, many people I think would think that it's just, you know, too rich and, and like that. Yeah, so, so therefore, when, when someone performs pious activity in like a pure state or relatively, it's called not just, well, it's called nishkam karuna. Nishkam means without desire, material desire, but still it's like karma yoga. So it may act as a door, that's the point there. Um, then, let's go down devotees. See, my, I think it's maybe because I did it, but my version has these subheadings, makes it easier to find things. Go down a few paragraphs and you'll find, well, there's a couple of Sanskrit verses quoted. Um, you know, we're not getting into all the details, otherwise we'll have to be here for at least a week or 10 days. But if you go down past the couple of verses, then you'll see, um, yeah, moreover, Moreover, by such verses as Shriyasritim Bhaktim Udasyate Vipo, do you see that? Moreover, have you got it? Hmm? Have we lost you? You got it? The The paragraph before begins what is it however this statement refers to bhakti in the mode of material goodness moreover by such verses as what I just mentioned they show that uh, accomplishment of results on the paths of jnana, karma and yoga are dependent on bhakti you see that the point was bhakti is not dependent on such things like luck or pious activity. Yeah, so um, karma, yoga, jnana, these things, the results of them are dependent on bhakti. Bhakti is not dependent on them. Very important point. And there's actually some verses in Bhagavad Gita. Well, I could just mention, actually, first of all, that... Yeah. Anyway, there's some verses in Bhagavad Gita which made, make it quite clear. Well, okay, the structure of Bhagavad Gita, if you're, you know, if you're sort of up on Bhagavad Gita, more than the average devotee. You know, Bhagavad Gita is in three sections. The first six chapters, second six chapters, and third six chapters. The first six chapters are discussing yoga, or different types of yogas. Then in the center, that's chapters one to six, chapters seven to 12 are discussing bhakti, devotional service. And chapters 13 to 18 are discussing basically different types of jnana, knowledge, like the three modes of material nature, chapter 14, and what is it? Nature, the enjoyer, and consciousness is chapter 13. The divine and demoniac natures, chapter 16. And finally, there's a summary in, in 
the last chapter 18. So that's Gyan. Now the interesting point is the yoga and the Gyan, they're on either sides of the section on Bhakti, which is the center. And it's structured like that because these things are dependent on bhakti, therefore they have to be close to bhakti. Otherwise they won't have enough vitality to help people in those particular practices. Are you with me on that one? Yeah. So they're next to... So the main section in Bhagavad Gita is from chapter 7 to chapter 12 other than the last chapter, which is a summary. But what comes after chapter 12, other than the last chapter, is all secondary. It's not as important. So really the message of Bhagavad Gita is in uh, chapters 7 to 12. But for the sake of being merciful to yoga in the first six chapters, and then gyan, different types of, you know, indirectly related knowledge therefore they're placed on either side of bhakti which then empowers them right devotees i know did you find that paragraph i was referring to now um so so the main idea being pointed out in those few paragraphs there is how the karmi, particularly the karmis and the gyanis, the materialists, even the religious materialists like demigod worshippers, and the gyanis like the impersonalists and that sort of person, they struggle to achieve success. But the devotees are easily successful. And we can refer you, you can make a note, Bhagavad Gita chapter 18, verse 53, then 54. I won't, they're, they're quite long verses. Um, I won't go through them completely, but in 53, the point is made that a person, a, a, a yogi, a yogi, not attached to things, not into hatred, lives in a secluded place, eats little, controls the mind, the body, mind, and power of speech, always in trance, free from false ego, false strength, false pride, lust, anger, etc. So such a person becomes advanced. Then 54, in 54 Krishna says that a person who is in that way or by that means transcendentally situated um, attains pure devotional service or can attain devotional service yeah so and then you know having attained devotional service then one can go back to Godhead so so Krishna says, one can understand me as I am, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, only by devotional service. So having gone through all this rigorous renunciation and all that sort of thing, a person may come to the spiritual level, may become a devotee. But now, those who just take to devotional service only. Krishna says, although engaged in all kinds of activities, my pure devotee under my protection reaches the eternal and imperishable abode by my grace. Although engaged in all kinds of activities, for example, um, Arjuna, killing people, loads of people, yeah, and, and others who are like Vaishas, Vaishas who are devotees like the Bridge Bussies, they're 
they're agriculturalists and they have cows. So, you know, these are kind of like ordinary activities. These are not like super duper spiritual activities. They're just ordinary ways for Vaishyas to earn livings. So, therefore, Krishna says, although engaged in all kinds of activities, yeah, my devotee under my protection reaches the eternal abode. Yeah. So, yes, even, even though the devotee may be engaged in many ordinary type activities, and not the stringent renunciation, etc., of the jnanis. But the devotee easily goes back to Godhead. Vishnath Chakrabani Thakur in his purport to that verse, um, he says that, well, Krishna says, by my grace, this devotee reaches the eternal abode. Uh, Krishna Chakvari Thakwa says that Arjuna says that this is, you know, I can't understand it. These other people, the Gyanis, go through such stringent processes and they may come to devotional service. But these devotees, kind of ordinary people on a certain level, by Krishna's grace, by your grace, they go back to Godhead. How can it be? And Krishna says, yes, it is by my mercy, which is what he said. My mercy is very powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of by the way, actually, to some degree. Then karmis, you know, karmis, in order to do like demigod worship or fire sacrifices successfully they have to do everything just right if they make a mistake small mistake the whole thing can be a total flop zero result and a classic example if you're familiar with the Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, it's a bit of a long story, but Vishvakarma wanted to kill Indra or have Indra killed because Indra had killed one of his sons, whose name was Vishvarup. So he did a big yagya, a big fire yagya, to produce a person who could kill Indra. Not exactly, the, uh, the, the words he used were not exactly to kill, but to produce someone who would be the enemy of Indra. So the, someone to be the enemy of Indra, the term is Indra Shatraho. Notice the Aho, Shatraho, the priest mispronounced by one syllable. Instead of Indra Shatraho, he said In Indra Shatro, that Indra will be his enemy. In other words, Indra can kill him. So the point is, you know, these devotees like Arjuna going around killing people, the bridge buses, farming, and, you know, doing these everyday types of activities. Because they're devotees, they get the Lord's mercy. But if you're trying to do karma or gyan for any purpose, then you make a small mistake, and the whole thing becomes total failure. Because, in that story of, of uh, Vishvakarma, from the Yajna came Vritrasura, huge demon, and it looked like he could kill Indra, but he couldn't, and he didn't. 
and Indra killed him. So it means the whole purpose of the whole thing was completely, it was a total failure. So the devotional service is so nice that even if, you know, you're a bit sloppy, yeah, or something like that, like when the Chinese devotees first came to Mayapur, then we noticed they pronounced the mantra a little unusually because Chinese people, to some degree, they have a tendency to pronounce the letter R as an as L. So Hare Krishna becomes Hare Krishna, something like, you know, some, something like that. We have a Chinese person here, my God. Am I, am I insulting you? <laughs> I'm not saying it's everyone, but uh, like, not you. <laughs> so the devotees noticed that some, some of them were chanting something like, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, something like that. And the idea arose, maybe they should be given elocution lessons. Elocution means pronunciation lessons. Yeah. But then, then it was noticed that actually they were really nice devotees with many devotional qualities. So it was understood then that they, their devotion, their chanting, even though in a certain sense it was a little unusual at least, in some cases, but Krishna was accepting it. And therefore they were making progress and they were good devotees. So we didn't give them elocution lessons. Right, so now devotees, we go on to the second chapter or the second shower of nectar which is about Bhajana Kriya. And let's move along a bit. Oh, let's move, my gosh. We've got to move along a bit. Otherwise, you know, we might uh, ha have to extend the seminar. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Okay. Yes, so we go on, right? So first of all, there's a discussion about, let's see. Well, let's, uh, let me just read a little bit here from the beginning of the chapter. <coughs> Second paragraph, the wish yielding creeper. Have you got that? The wish yielding creeper. Is it the same in your version? Second paragraph or third sentence at least. Have you got it? Wish for yes. fulfilling. Yes. The wish fulfilling. Okay, so <laughs> there are different versions, you see. Anyway, okay, the wish fulfilling creeper of pure bhakti which grows in the field of the heart is the refuge of the devotees who firmly vow never to seek any fruits except bhakti and who like bees are obsessed with the desire to taste nectar. Is your version something? Yeah, it's very much the same. Thing. Very much. You're okay? You're with us? Okay. And then the very life of this creeper is a favorable attitude to devotion and the Lord. Like a touchstone, its very presence makes the heart lose its iron-like material qualities and acquire spiritual qualities of pure gold or bhakti. That's also something similar. So there is now a discussion about sadhana bhakti for about, at least in my version, couple, three paragraphs actually. T 
two types of sadhana bhakti. And the example is given of a creeper. Bhakti develops in the heart, it sort of grows in the heart, like a creeper may grow. And as a creeper has leaves, an ordinary creeper, so the creeper of bhakti has leaves. Now, the lower part of the, of the leaf is a bit rougher than the top part. The top part is smooth and maybe shiny. Bottom part of the leaf is a bit rough. So these are two types of sadhana bhakti. The bottom part, which is more rough, is vaidhi sadhana bhakti. Sadhana bhakti meaning the practice of devotional service, but vaidhi meaning according to rules and regulations, basically. Whereas the top part of the leaf of sadhana bhakti is raganuga, which is a much more advanced level. Uh, a devotee will generally not at all be able to practice Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti if they have not been through Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. And you know, without getting, someday we can have a seminar on these two types of Sadhana Bhakti. But uh, yeah, anyway, it's like that that you have to go through Vaidhi, that, that not everyone who is successful in Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti will take to Raganuga Sadhana Bhakti. They may go on to perfection just with Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, the practice of devotional service under rules and regulations. So he discusses that. And like I said, we're not getting into it in detail. Then he talks about how there are different five kinds of kleshas or sufferings. Can you see that? One is just avidya or ignorance. Another one is asmita or false ego. Another one is rag or attachment to material happiness and material things. A fourth one is dwesha or hatred. Basically, aversion to unhappiness or the causes of unhappiness. And then, then there's abhinivesha, long-standing obsessions, like long-standing attraction to material life, basically, yeah, attachment to the body. Right, so now, the, if we go down a little further, let's see, what would it be? It should be about three or, f about four or five paragraphs. We come to a paragraph which says, talks about the devotee taking shelter of the spiritual master. The, the beginner uh, inquires from the spiritual master, mixes with devotees, and then engages in bhajana kriya. Do you see that? The mention of the term bhajana kriya takes up practice of different types of service. This is called bhajana kriya. But there are two types of bhajana kriya. One is called unsteady and the other is called steady. Yes, so initially, initially, even though the devotee is practicing devotional service, initially they'll be unsteady. They won't be steady. Only when they come to nishta, the level of nishta, the fifth level, will they actually become really like stable and steady in Krishna consciousness. So the question arises, 
How could it be if someone's taken up devotional service that they're unsteady and sort of, you know, get spaced out, as we say sometimes, and, you know, do some silly things and like that. And, and maybe, you know, in some cases they may break a principle or, you know, they're just, uh, you know, I, I've stayed in the houses of many devotees. And in some cases, at least in the past, when they were not looking, I would go and check their fridges <laughs> for the achas and other things, goodies in the fridge. And almost inevitably I find something which on the lab label it says onions, garlic. I mean it was generally I would say, or at least quite often. So you know it just means they're not being really careful. They're devotees. They're chanting Hare Krishna, but they're not really being careful. So, so this is the thing. How, how can it be that devotees in Bhajana Kriya, they're doing devotional service under the spiritual master with the devotees, but they, they're unsteady. It's because of the presence of, um, well, of anathas actually. Although anathas like serious anathas are going to be discussed a little further on. But sort of childish anathas, childish anathas, not really so bad, but still they're definitely sort of opposed to your advancement in Krishna consciousness. So he mentions here six types of unsteady devotional service. I think you can see that, can't you? Six types listed in sequential order. In other words, in the very early stages you'll have the first one, as you move on a little bit, you'll have the second one. Move on a little further, you'll have the third one. So they're, list, they're listed out there, right? Are they listed out there? False confidence, Utsahamai. Sporadic endeavor, Ganatarala. Indecision, Vyudavikalpa. Struggling with Maya, like fighting with Maya. Vishaya Sangra, uh, the inability to uphold vows, Niyamakshama, and enjoying the waves of Bhakti, Tarangarangani. And each one causes unsteadiness in devotional service, even though you're engaged in devotional service. So, Let's just go through them, and this is, it can even be a bit amusing in one sense, but when you, when you see that, oh, I do that, <laughs> then it's not so amusing. <laughs> it's more embarrassing or something. So, okay, first one's Utsaha Mai, childish enthusiasm. And I can tell you a little story which illustrates this which definitely some of you have heard before, about the deity installation in Amsterdam, 1972. You know that story? You know that story. Anyway, some of you know that story. Prabhupada was present, and they're doing a deity installation, but they'd never done one before. And they just made such a mess. Everything was going wrong. And Prabhupada was pointing out, you know, what, don't do that and do this. And he was getting progressively more angry. And they're about to do the fire yagya. And they had, you know, one of these metal Havan Kun type things. And it was just there, sort of naked metal. And Prabhupada said, where is the fruit? because you're meant to put whole fruits around. 
So temple president thought, ah, the fruit. Where's the fruit? Okay, he ran into the kitchen. Where's the fruit? Prabhupada wants the fruit. Where is it? They cut up a big fruit salad <laughs> in not more than two minutes. The quickest fruit salad in the history of Iskand. And the temple president came out with this big bowl of fruit salad. Here's the fruit to the Prabhupada. And Prabhupada, they say that when Prabhupada was angry, he would chastise. He would point it out. Something's wrong. But when he was really angry, he wouldn't say anything. So this time, Prabhupada, he's sitting there. Here's the, here's the fruit, Prabhupada. He didn't say anything. He just looked away. Silence. Standing right here, right where this microphone stand is, was one hippie boy, like really authentic hippie. Long, greasy, dirty hair. Clothes he'd been wearing for some days. Socks he'd been wearing for some days. Yeah, really. But he was a bit of a devotee, and he was chanting Japa, and standing right next to Prabhupada, right next to the Asasa. And Prabhupada looked over with this sort of look of, anyway, not very happy look. And this young man, he saw this, and you know, he's not like a serious devotee, but he's sort of somewhere around. He leaned over to Prabhupada and said, Srila Prabhupada, just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> it's such a the classic <laughs> of childish enthusiasm. You know, who would say that to Srila Prabhupada? Who, who has their head even half screwed on? <laughs> and Prabhupada looked at him and picked up his beads and started chanting. Because they say you can take dirt from a, I mean, take gold from a dirty place. <laughs> then the next one is Ganatarala. Alternating enthusiasm for devotional activities and alternating with negligence. I remember we had one boy in central London when I joined one day somehow he just got super inspired and now he's up at two in the morning right outside the door of the brahmachari ashram chanting you know really chanting hey krishna hey krishna you know like that real serious japa just a matter of a few feet away from the devotees who are sleeping at two in the morning so the devotees got so a couple of devotees got up and shouted at him, stop that or go somewhere else, well, what are you doing? And it was a shock because he thought, I'm doing a good thing. <laughs> Next day, he didn't even get up for prasadam, for breakfast. And you must know someone's really depressed if they don't get up for breakfast. So yeah, alternating enthusiasm and then negligence or lack of enthusiasm. Then Virya Vikalpa, in the book itself you'll see Virya Vikalpa means speculation, extensive speculation. What should I do? And it's a sort of classic example with many devotees. Should I become a Krishna conscious householder and bring up my family in pure Krishna consciousness? Or should I just renounce everything and be a renunciant? So this debate has been there in the minds of many devotees. Yeah. Because, you know, they feel if I become a householder, well, you know, I may end up watching Bollywood on TV. So it would be better if I didn't become a householder, if I renounced. But, but could, would I be able to manage it? 
So this speculation goes on. It may be about different things, but that's one of the classic subject matters. And the next one is Vishaya Sangara. Vishaya Sangara. Declaring war on sense gratification, but then not being able to maintain like real renunciation from sense gratification. We had one boy, you may have heard, I, I mentioned it a few times before. He understood, I am not this body. And therefore, because I'm not this body, I don't need to sleep. Because I'm not this body, I'm spirit soul. So he was taking like maybe a couple of hours sleep a night because he's not this body, which is true. But it's like, it's very immature in terms of spiritual depth. So we, in those days, practically everyone except the pujaris and the cooks would go out on book distribution in London. You know, like 30 or 40 devotees would just all go out to different parts of the city. And most, many of us, we'd go out on the underground railway. So he would get on the train. He's going to go, you know, he's been assigned, you go to this particular place. And as soon as he sat down, what would happen? He was asleep. And I mean, really asleep. Not just sort of dozing, but he was in another world, in dreamland. And he didn't wake up until the train reached the end of the line. And the people came around and said, get off the train. So he crossed the, st the, the platform, got on the train going back the other way, sat down and <laughs> fell asleep. And eventually he'd get off somewhere, <laughs> you know, he'd wake up somewhere. But it's artificial. You declare war on sense gratification, but you're not able to maintain such a standard. Yeah. The next one, number five, Niyama, niyama Akshama, means inability to follow positive rules. Niyama means positive rules. You must do this. Chant so many rounds. You must, uh, you know, read the books. And whereas Vishaya Sangra is referring to renouncing material things. So yes, so I mean, I have seen. I have seen. Devotees are not ready for it, deciding, right, I must chant 64 rounds a day. And you know, so they're up till midnight. They're up till midnight trying to finish 64 rounds and just throws everything out. So yeah, a person may try to take on more devotional activities than they're really capable at this point of executing in, you know, balanced and, uh, yeah, nice ways. Oh, the Vishaya Sangara, renouncing sense gratification, let me mention another example. Devotee decides, right, I am not this body, right, so I must eat extremely little once a day yeah so they try to really just cut down on their eating <clears throat> and they can manage for some days but after a while you know it gets a bit much for them and then suddenly you find like in a bigger temple like in Lanasia there are six offerings of food to the deities now this devotee is collecting maha from all six of the offerings. <laughs> but 
I thought you were announcing it. I thought this is, it is Prasadam Prabhu. <laughs> so, you know, don't criticize me. And then Taranga Rangani is the last one, riding the little waves. They're not big waves, they're little waves. Um, of some advancement in Krishna consciousness. What's mentioned here, um, well, at least in, in my book, that there's a popular, well, it is well established that people become attracted to a person who possesses bhakti due to bhakti's auspiciousness. That's there under Tarangarangani. As the popular saying goes, by attracting the populace, one becomes wealthy. People may donate to you. I mean, the, the, one of the typical things is, particularly if you're a devotee living in like an area which is like a Hindu area, you could say, then you may, it may be your, the first day you have put a dhoti on in your life. You may have even put it on backwards, as long as it doesn't fall off. And your tilak is sort of, you know, splodged in one way or another. But you go door to door amongst the very nice Hindu people, and some nice Hindu gentleman opens the door, and, oh! The Swami has arrived. Please come in, Swami. Would you like some fruit? Can I give you some milk? And before you know, you're doing very well. Yeah. And then this very new devotee thinks, this is really good being a Swami. I like this. So riding the waves. But they're just little waves, sort of like of admiration from innocent people who don't really know better. Now, yeah, we're over time, but let's carry on. Do you mind if we carry on for 10 minutes? Because we're going to anyway, so. <laughs> It's too bad. <laughs> it's like there's a saying in Russia. Yes, we need volunteers to do something. And if no one volunteers, we will appoint volunteers. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, here we go. Let's have a look at the first paragraph. Very important. Successful performance of devotional activities. Bhajana Kriya. So the Bhajana Kriya stage is followed by Anatha Navriti. Yeah. Because through doing your devotional activities, as he says, um, bad qualities become cleared from the heart. Bad qualities that obstruct the progress of bhakti. So these Anathas, these bad qualities or Anathas, they be classified into four types according to their origin. Those coming from your previous sinful activities, those coming, would you believe it, from your previous pious activities, those arising for offenses, aparad, and those arising from imperfectly performed devotional service. You have that. More or less, yes. approximately, yes. yeah. So there are four types, from previous sin, previous piety, from aparad, real aparad, and then sort of like mistakes that someone may make as they're trying to render devotional service. So there's a whole description here. I won't go through all the details. But, um, let's just consider, let's consider, 
previous sin and that is arising from previous sin what are they or the way he what is it now is it the second paragraph it's the next paragraph Anathas, obstructions to bhakti arising from sinful activities are the five types of kleshas. You remember, we just read them a few minutes ago. You remember? Klesh, the five types of kleshas. Ignorance, false ego, attachment, hatred, and long-standing attachments like deeper attachments than just your everyday attachments. So these types of things are the anathas which arise from your previous sinful activity. Do you get the idea? These are the anathas which arise from your previous sinful activity. And even it may be going back into a previous lifetime, like the long-standing anathas. Yes, then, anathas arising, he doesn't so much, he doesn't so much. In fact, he doesn't really. Well, yeah. Okay, in the same paragraph. Some people include the anathas arising from pious activities under the categories of the kleshas, but, but maybe, maybe not. You know, anathas arising from previous piety are like tendencies, like addiction to the results of piety, like sattva gun sense enjoyment like Prabhupada, when Prabhupada got very sick for the first time in New York and then he eventually went back to India for some time but the devotees trying to help him recover in New York they rented a place somewhere no that was out in uh, it was the same time yeah out in California rented a place by the seaside for Prabhupada. And so Prabhupada's there with a group of devotees looking after him. One day he's looking for one of the devotees. And he asks, where's such and such? And the devotees say, well, you know, up, up the hill is a farm with cows. He's gone to chant Japa to the cows. And Prabhupada said, useless. <laughs> Prabhupada did not appreciate it. So it's, you know, it's kind of sense of gratification, peaceful environment, the cows, it's very nice. And I'll chant to the cows. So that's a type of anatha arising from previous piety, attraction to sattva gun the mode of goodness to the exclusion of Krishna consciousness. Yeah, like being attached to comfortable living, not, not being willing to surrender to some difficult service. Prabhupada said that when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was living and the head of Gaudiya Matt, he encouraged the devotees to go out and distribute literature. But many of them would not do it because they said, we may, you know, we'll have to hassle the people, stop the people, try and get money from the people. And, you know, it's kind of passionate. It's too passionate dealing with these people. We don't want to fall down into the mode of passion. So we will sit in the temple and chant Hare Krishna very peacefully. Mode of goodness. But Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, my, my question is not that is there a danger of you falling into the mode of passion? My, my question is 
will you be able to come up to the mode of passion? Did you get that? From the mode of ignorance. Because ignorance, passion, goodness is a hierarchy. So my question is, when will you come up to the mode of passion? <laughs> yeah, so people, devotees may feel like that. If, if you're doing a service, like maybe you're the temple president, he's not here today, but anyway. Oh, yes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Excuse me. I should probably block your ears for this. But, you know, some services, sometimes, I mean, generally not always, but sometimes they're difficult. And sometimes they can really be difficult, depending on your personality and, you know. So therefore a devotee may think, no, 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 no. I will not be the temple. I'll give up that service because it's too difficult. It's basically a desire for something more sattvic and nice and pleasant. It's an anatha arising from previous piety and inclination towards peacefulness and everything being very nice. Then there's a whole lengthy discussion about Nam Aparad, which we'll do, we'll go through, not tomorrow for some reason, we're not having a program, but Thursday. Okay, sorry about that, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> so please come on Thursday, because these things are very relevant. Just like those six types of, you know, sort of obstacles, like childish anathas in Vajna Kriya. Yeah, so these four types of anathas it's very important to understand them and learn how to deal with them. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki.